Welcome to the Texas Conflict Coach radio program. If you've ever experienced or engaged in destructive or unresolved conflict, then you know it leads to broken relationships, distrust, and damaging results. Our program will help you manage and resolve conflict effectively with strategies, valuable resources, and support. Since 2009, our radio program hosted guest experts from around the globe sharing their perspectives, experiences, and expertise while giving you food for thought. If you can't listen live, then download and listen to any of our 300-plus podcasts in our library at texasconflictcoach.com. So sit back, relax, or join the conversation every Tuesday evening or tweet us at TX Conflict Coach. With the start of a new academic year, college athletes and coaches prepare for another athletic season and often an entirely new environment. They encounter new team members, the pressures of performance, and a longing for home. Today's program will discuss what student athletes and coaches can do to optimize their performance on and off the field. Hello, I'm your guest host, Stephen Kotev, and joining me today for our program entitled Student Athletes in Transition, Secrets to Success, is the founder of the Sports Conflict Institute, Joshua Gordon. Joshua is a mediator, facilitator, educator, and organizational capacity builder with over 20 years of experience. He specializes in sports-related conflict management, building on a history of context that have included business-to-business, organizational change, energy, environmental, real estate and housing, family, and gang-related conflicts and disputes. Joshua founded the Sports Conflict Institute after previously directing the Competition Not Conflict Project at the Oregon, at the University of Oregon School of Law Appropriate Dispute Resolution Center. He has created a number of cutting-edge conflict management tools and curriculum, including the play-by-play model, outside the box, inside the ring, stop bully, conflict, sports conflict observation tools, and a myriad of others. Welcome to the show, Joshua. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. I appreciate it. Well, you're doing some really interesting stuff, Joshua, and I'm really curious about how you started down this path of working with athletics and conflict resolution. So conflict resolution was a starting point professionally where I've been part of mediation programs and ombuds offices really for the better part of the past 20 years. And on the side, I've always been an athlete. So I, I've been a runner and a baseball player. I've played tennis, basketball, and, and you name it. And sports have been a big part of my my free time and my life. And really, you know, you reach a certain point in your career, you start trying to figure out how can you merge your personal passion and the things you do professionally, and, and that's really what drove it. And so there, there was an opportunity to do that with the University of Oregon School of Law, and uh, I haven't looked back since. So you get a chance to, in a sense, Put, pull together everything that you love to do um, all at the same time. At least that's what it sounds like. Yeah, so the way I put it, you know, if I talk to some of my students, I, I teach a bit as well. What, one of the ways to really check if you're in the right part of your field is to think about what you read for pleasure. And so I have always gone to the sports section first and then the business section and kind of work my way around from there. And, yeah, I found myself professionally, you know, doing land use disputes and indigenous populations and water and environmental and all very interesting things. But then when I go home, that wasn't what I was, you know, opening the magazine to. It was always sports. And so to try and shift it to the right spot seemed like the natural fit for me. Well, and, and what you're doing, I think, is, is really, really interesting. And... I think what would be helpful is, is why don't you talk a little bit about the Sports Conflict Institute, and then from there I want to sort of bring us into how student-athletes can prepare for school and what advice can you give them to, to, to prepare for this transition. Sure. So the Sports Conflict Institute, or as we, we call it, SCI, it really is founded with two major avenues. One is to create a knowledge center to really – uh, push, fo- uh, push forward thought and, and understanding in this space. So the way we look at it, there's a lot of people in the sports world who know very little b- about conflict management. And similarly, there are a lot of people in the conflict management fields who 
don't know a whole lot about some of the unique challenges in the sports world. And so we, we've worked very hard to put together a lot of thought, uh, leadership, and resources that others can access to our knowledge center. That's been a, an area of, of personal pride and, and for the whole institute. Then similarly, we do uh, consulting work, and we spend quite a bit of time dealing with some of the more complicated problems in sports, predominantly in three areas, uh, the Olympic groups, um, professional, and then intercollegiate being a, a very large focus. And, and, and that, that's a fascinating, you know, I, I know I asked you two questions. I just got to jump in because I think what you're doing is, is absolutely fascinating and I think sort of the, the future for folks. And so I'm really glad that you're with us today because you're putting together two things that, as you said before, maybe not everyone has, has put has married them together, but you're doing it at a, at a pretty deep level. And so, you know, l let's go into our question because, we, you know, you're, you've done a lot of work with collegiate athletes. You know, as we're talking about student athletes getting ready to go to school, what advice can you give them to help them prepare for this transition? That's sort of the, the, the question that our, our talk is about today. But I think folks are going to be impressed with what, you, what you're doing because it's, it's much deeper than I, I think a lot of folks would have assumed. Yeah, so you know we're we're using every tool we have in the toolbox for, as a conflict management professional. So we're we're not just coming in with a mediation hammer and seeing everything as a nail. We're we draw on everything from organizational development to mediation to you know negotiation to really looking at things like culture and character and motivational profiles to to be fairly comprehensive in the work we do. It, when you talk about as we head into fall, it gets very interesting this time period. So at the college level, what you see is coaches have spent a lot of time trying to convince high-performing student-athletes to join their program. And so they, they paint a pretty picture of what that experience is going to be like. And then when you arrive, you're in a very different relationship. You're no longer a recruit. You're now the, the lowest you know man or woman on the totem pole. And you have to adjust to a, a situation that's often quite different than wherever you came from before. Same, same thing if you're heading into high school or out of college into the pros. Those transitions are really challenging. It's where we tend to lose a lot of people. And so what, what we're looking to do is really help create some of the structures and knowledge to set up for success. And we define success as, as both performance on the field but then also performance off the field. So let's dig a little bit deeper because, you know, this is the thing I think that you were sort of touching on, on on the type of tools that you would have folks engage with. But, you know, okay, so one of the bits of advice that I got that I thought was really good was, you know, okay, you're no longer sort of in that courting stage where, you know, the coach is trying to get you and convince you and, you know, hey, you've got this sort of feeling of everybody wants me. Well, you signed on and now you show up. And you're you're you gotta in a sense start all over, and you're no longer the you know maybe center of attention or star of wherever you came from. You're integrating in. So like what else? What else are these folks, these students can do to what advice? What other advice can you give them other than like hey it's a new day you gotta you gotta get ready for that. Well, so a lot of it is about aligning expectations, right? So we're trying to figure out what is. Understand what is the mission of your university that you're joining, if we're talking about college level. What is the mission of the team? What are the specific goals and values that they have? And then how can you align yourself to those so that you're on, on the same page? And sometimes that can be driven from the, the athlete or the student athlete perspective. Other times it's, it's working with coaches to help them really truly understand who they've brought onto their campus and figure out how do you get the most out of that, that person. Certainly, you know, as we all know, that people have very different motivational profiles and work habits and ways that they will perform at their best. And with, whether it's traveling or, you know, the, you know, who's going to be homesick in that first week on, on campus? Who's going to be just thrilled with the excitement? Who needs help focusing? Who needs help, you know, not being so focused that they don't diversify their experience? And the, it, so a lot of it's just really same clear uh, understanding of what should be those norms uh, of the team and, and, and how do you want people following them, and then how do you 
um, you know, deal with conflict that's inevitably going to come up as as you work together in the you know year ahead. So that's that's great advice. So it's in a sense get to know where you're at and what they're about, and and really and really figure that out. Especially if you're an athlete, you know, I think that's really very very helpful. But what's also I think very interesting about the work that you're doing is is that you're not limiting it to one area. You're taking a look at sort of this this um, you know, 360 or comprehensive or system-wide, whatever the word you want to use is across the board, Um, because you started talking about coaches. And, you know, let's talk some more about coaches because, you know, they're really central to it. And you you sort of touched on some of the stuff about who you're recruiting and how they look at it. But I want you to sort of, you know, dig a little bit deeper into that and help folks better understand, you know, especially if anybody is a coach listening in, like what, what, what what advice would you give to them? Yeah, so as a coach, it all begins with first and foremost knowing yourself. So we, one of the things that we've constructed is essentially a, a leadership model specific to sports and, and coaching to understand what, well, how are you as a coach? What are your, your styles? What, are, are you someone who's more autocratic? Are you someone who's more of a motivator? You know, what, what type of energy do you bring to the whole equation? And then, and then, not only how are you normally, but how are you under stress? You know, what's your, your stress style? What's that look like? If you start with that and you have an understanding of yourself as a coach, then you can start to figure out, all right, well, you know, do you have to recruit a very particular type of athlete who's going to thrive under you? Or are you someone who maybe actually has some flexibility in styles of coaching? And so then you know you, you can recruit lots of athletes, but you're going to have to learn how to coach each of them you know, where they're at. So we, we often talk about meeting the athlete where they're at rather than doing it under your own terms as a coach. But but if we're dealing with a coach who they have a way and they have a system and we, we certainly work with a number of them, then it's about helping them figure out who are those athletes that are going to thrive under them and really putting your energy into only bringing those folks on so that you're not creating a, you know, a structural flaw from the outset where you're absolutely going to have um, dissension and, and tension in the relationship. And, and I really think this is genius. You know, my experience or my background is just in martial arts. You know, I've done martial arts for a really long time, and I've seen, in a sense, you know, kind of what fruit falls from the tree, you know, what, what that looks like and how different types of um, attitudes on coaching can, you know, uh, fundamentally affect so much, not only the athlete, but the overarching environment. And so, you know, I really think that the advice that you're giving is, is really, really valuable for folks because, um, you know, I, I don't know how many folks actually ever put that together. And I imagine when you come in and talk to them, they, they've got to be really thankful to, to have some sort of tool to think about this or deal with it. Yeah, so so much of coaching has been passed down you know, through folklore and through modeling and apprenticeship over the years. And, and yet, as we've seen, e- even at the college level, as sports has become more of a professionalized entity and the expectations and the visibility are, are different than they were 20 years ago and really, frankly, different than they were even 5 to 10 years ago. Well, th- then what do we do to create learning environments for coaches and, and student-athletes alike where they're they're understanding that it's not just about doing something that historically was done to you and not not continuing to pass down traditions and, and um, you know, a culture, essentially, that may be counter to what you're trying to achieve. So we see lots of uh, coaches and programs who have inherited a culture that probably was done to them. There's a certain way of talking. There's a, a way of behaving that had a time and place but maybe doesn't anymore. And so h- helping them figure out, okay, well, Yes, you know the game, and we're not going to come here. If you're a basketball coach, we're not going to teach you how to be a better basketball coach from an X and O standpoint, but we can help you be a better person when it comes to the relationships on your team for sure. And that's what I think is just really great about this type of work is is that you're really adding to what's already there, but in many circumstances it's almost like a way for them to – to evolve, improve, um, in some cases maybe just save face. You know, it's sort of like, all right, you, you know you're supposed to be the most fearsome person in the land, but what, what's that actually look like? 
you know, are you able to keep people? You know, are you able to deal with some of the, the things that you've got to deal with or get the most out of, out of folks? And, you know, I, I really think that that kind of approach is a really insightful way of dealing with it. And it's a delicate balance. Uh, you know, there's certainly something we call coach's prerogative where we are not on equal power footing when you're talking about athletics. And the coaches have a defined power structure, and, and, and there's clearly a certain hierarchy that we expect out of sports. At the same time, you know, those of us who have been in this field for a long time, we know that power comes from many places. Power doesn't just come from the person you say is the, is the powerful one in the relationship, but there are other, other ways people exert power, some positive, some not so positive. And so we, we help them understand a little more holistically that relationship. And, and frankly, when is it appropriate to go to your given power and when might you, you try and, you know, use some of the other sources of power uh, that you also bring to the, the table to motivate. And, and really, people embrace it. They're looking for answers. Uh, the coaches we work with are very inquisitive. They're, they're a lot of fun. And, and really, you know, if you give them information, they're, they're willing to run with it. And, and how we teach it becomes a real challenge because it, often the request of how we should teach it is a lot different than how you need to teach it. I would like to remind our listeners that you are listening to the Texas Conflict Coach Blog Talk Radio Program with your guest host, myself, Stephen Kotev. Today I'm joined by Joshua Gordon as part of our Back to School series, and we're discussing student athletes in transi- transition, secrets to success. So you just talked a bit about power and different sources of power, and let's talk about parents because they're in the middle of this transition. Sometimes they're going to feel really powerful. Sometimes they're going to feel powerless. They may have their own expectations that may or may not be in alignment with the student. But, you know, what kind of advice do you have for parents who are in this whole process of transition and, you know, are, have a child who's in, you know, uh, very serious athletics? Yeah, it, it's a real challenge. Uh, when we, we run an ombuds program uh, dealing primarily with youth sports in this particular program, and that doesn't mean we're sitting around and resolving conflict between young athletes. It means that we're dealing with parents, parents and coaches. And, and one of the things that we find is that parents have a really challenging time, um, you know, separating who, whose experience it is. And, and we don't say that to be critical. It comes from a good place, right? Everyone wants what's best for their kid. They see that athletics has a potential to be an avenue for things like college scholarships and, and uh, you know, success and fame and, and all of these things. And we, we could sit there and spend all day talking about the statistics of how hard that path is, but people still are chasing that dream wholeheartedly. And so it, it's quite a challenge to get them out of what we call burging, which is that whole idea of basking in reflective glory. And, and parents um, need to be given constructive things to do in this relationship. So we, we work with them you know, as well to try and figure out what can you be doing. If you're at a game, for, for example, we, we've developed some observation tools. What can you be doing that's constructive, that's not you know, armchair coaching, not screaming things out, not um, amplifying you know, stressful moments in the relationship between your son and daughter and their coach. And that, that carries on with college as well. We have a lot of helicopter parents who fly in and want to be involved, have advice for coaches. And you know, at a certain point, part of the college experience is to help the, these young student athletes develop into men and women and, and learn some of these skills that you know, organized sports um, can help a lot with but, but also can be impeded if parents are overly involved. Well, and you just gave us a lot of really good recommendations, and I just I want to go back just a little bit because you said a couple of things that I think were really interesting. So you call it burging? Is that where it's sort of like that of like that's my girl or that's my boy, that's the the star of the team? Is 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 that the reflective basking in the glory that you're talking about? Yeah, there's an emotional roller coaster that parents can be really, yeah, subject to go down and up and down. And so it, it, you're hoping that your parents can get on a very disconnected, supportive, level playing field at all times where they're not the ones going up and down with every win and loss, that they're not seeing it as part of their own personal identity. And, but, but the reality is people often do. 
that how well their son and daughter are doing on the playing field makes them feel better about themselves. And it's, it's a real challenge because that's a lot of pressure, whether you're talking about you know, a high school athlete or younger or you're talking about a college athlete, there's already tremendous strains on them. And to have that additional strain that someone else's identity or, or happiness is connected somehow to this is, is really a lot, lot of pressure. So what, what we're trying to do is help parents understand that if you, if you truly want what's best for your son or daughter, some of that's going to be involved a, a certain detachment that's actually going to benefit them and, and lead to a better chance of success in the ways that they're defining it. And, and that's, that's, I think, um, you know, you're, the terminology that you're using, the way you're presenting it, um, you know, I think for folks who maybe are living it but don't know how to process it, you know, I think that stuff's just got to be so valuable because um, I think a lot of times from the outside you'll see folks who, you know, it's almost like they're living vicariously through their child and how you, you know, you're saying, you know, it's okay to, to be happy for your kid and if you want to help the kid, here's some things that could actually be useful versus, you know, trying to go in and armchair quarterback, um, you know, what's going on because, you know, then you can sort of highlight the friction that gets generated between, you know, um, a parent and a coach. Um, so, you know, all those type of insights I, I really think um, are very valuable. Um, let's kind of stick with that but then move move along for, say, we've got listeners who are, are either high school athletes or um, parents of high school or younger athletes. You know, if you're somebody who's not in collegiate but maybe moving to a collegiate or, say, middle school, moving to high school, what kind of advice, um, you know, do you have for them? And does, is it any different from the, the prior advice you've given for these uh, younger athletes? So uh, a lot of it follows similarly, but I think one of the things that we're hoping to do with any athlete, young, young or old, is help them develop a realistic sense of self. The, the only way that, you know, you, you're truly going to improve, and we, we talk about putting in things like development plans. If you're a coach, we, we want you to put in development plans for your athletes so that they have a clear path of what needs to be worked on, not, not just on the field but off the field and, and, and other things that you're looking to that aligns to the mission. Well, you, in order to take that seriously, that process, you, you can't just understand yourself as a, a sum of your – you know, positive traits and some of your successes. You, you also have to be a, aware of where there are improvement opportunities. Where can you get better? What what else can you do? And defining that in, in pretty clear terms. So I think one of the things that, um, you know, par parents often see their own children through very rose-colored glasses, right? So they, they see all the successes that their kids have. They see the strengths. They see that they should be playing more, and, and that becomes self-perpetuating in the image. For, for that young athlete, and then it doesn't set them up to be able to handle some of the adversity that's going to happen. There's going to be lots of moments in your athletic career where you're not getting the playing time you want, you're not in the role that you want, you don't like the way the coach is treating you, you don't like the way your teammates are treating you, and to be able to go back to your, your comfort place, to your family, and, and have them not just yes you, but to have them spend time with you help you understand that situation from a, a more balanced approach where they're, they're looking and saying, well, what are, are some of the ways you may have contributed to that? And what are some of the, you know, additional questions you might want to ask to understand the situation better and not just pile and say, yes, you're absolutely right. You've been done wrong here. Your coach is treating you poorly. Your teammates are treating you poorly. And, and so we're trying to help change that, that dialogue. And it's, it's all the skills that we do in conflict management all the time. Um, mm -hmm. It's the mediator skills. It's open, you know, open-ended questions. It's, it's all of that, reframing, listening better. And so we, we have some models like the play-by-play -play model that, that help give a fairly simple mnemonic to remember, you know, a, a pretty healthy way to deal with some of these more difficult conversations that happen in sports. So, you know, I'm listening to this type of advice. What I'm hearing is is that, you know, first and foremost, you know, be be prepared to be accountable. That's kind of the way that I, I read it is, is that, yes, 
um, you know, everyone wants you to be successful, but to really be successful is about knowing yourself and being honest with yourself. And, you know, if you're a parent, don't sort of um, build up your kid uh, unfairly. But in the same sense, if you're, the, you know, the, a younger athlete, it's this thing of, yeah, you're going to have a bad day. Don't let that hold you back, but also be prepared to listen. Is that right? Yeah, and you know, I think we find parents often at the two extremes. Either they're overwhelmingly positive or they're overwhelmingly critical. We, we, we find that it's really hard to find a group of parents who are as balanced as they probably need to be in a healthy way. And, and part of that I do think is a, is a healthy detachment so that you know, your, your own sense isn't going up and down with your child's. And, and yes, accountability becomes a big part of that. Helping, helping build in a sense of, okay, well, why are you not getting playing time? Let's talk about this. What are the expectations from a more principled standpoint? What, what are the things that the coach has set forth that they say are part of that decision for playing time? Right? And, what, and what are you doing towards that? How many of those things have you done successfully? What, what areas could you improve to make it a harder decision for the coach in leaving you on the bench? What else could you do to make your teammates better, right? And, and really having them be a, a supportive counsel to question and help the growth. And that growth is both on the field and off the field that we're looking for. If you're not growing, um, you, you're really going to get passed by someone who is. And that, that we're talking about um, from a relationship management standpoint and then also, of course, from the you know, sports-specific skill standpoint. And that's what I think is, is really, really interesting about the work that you're doing is, is that, you know, that example you just gave is, you know, okay, understand how your sport functions. You know, if you're part of a team, well, how you, can you contribute to making your team better? And specifically, what players, you know, if you want to get, um, you want to get more playing time, well, how is the coach making that decision? You know, all those kind of things I think are really, really helpful for people to look at versus the, I'm just going to point the finger and say, oh, they don't like you or, you know, they don't realize how good you are. You know, I think that's, that's really, really helpful. And, you know, what kind of, you know, if folks want to engage with this further, if they want to learn more about it, you know, if you were going to give them an assignment for the week, you know, what would you encourage folks to do to, to learn more about the, the work that you're doing or to, to understand better the advice you've given them? Sure. I mean, certainly to visit our Knowledge Center, we put it all out there, open source, free. You don't even have to give us any information about you. If you were to go to sportsconflict.org, uh, very clearly on the front page you'll see Knowledge Center, and you click there, and there are lots and lots of re resources available to you. One of the ones I would highlight would be what we call strains of the games. And this really is a tool uh, that you can do it by yourself, but also with your team, um, and really trying to understand, well, what are those things that are going to cause stress? We know that stress impedes performance, and what are those things that are happening, not, not on the field, but around the games themselves, that, that are going to cause you stress? So whether it's dealing with social media or doing, dealing with parents and family or trying to find food that resembles home. You know, we're talking about transitions. People miss food as much as they miss people at times. And, you know, what about uh, roommates or what about um, some of the, the, the relationships that you have with your teachers or your professors? And so we have a whole set of checklists that we've developed that is part of working with Olympic athletes and Dr. Don Murray uh, help construct this tool along with us. And what, how would you rank those, and then what do you do to mitigate those stressors? That goes a long way. I mean, I'll give you an example. We're working with a, a tennis team, a college tennis team, and they were finding that a number of their international students, when they transitioned to campus, were really struggling. Uh, they, they were highly ranked uh, tennis players, and, and you would expect them to come out and perform at a certain level, and they just weren't. And as we started to, to put them through the strains of the games, what we started to learn was at least a handful of them were really struggling with missing family, missing home. And, and so what we worked with the coaching staff is a very simple fix was as part of that practice schedule, just as important as how many um, you know, serves you're going to hit and how many times you're going to hit forehands and backhands was putting a schedule together that involves Skyping with, you know, your mother and your father, and when is that going to be? It's scheduled just like everything else. And, and because there is a very 
structures their demands on young athletes. And, and we saw the performance, you know, change completely for these folks. And it's a simple one. Same with food was another one that was highlighted highly. So what you can do by having this tool is, is really think about what are those things that are causing stress and have that a structured conversation between coaches, parents, uh, and, and athletes, or ideally athletes and coaches, and leave the parents on the side on this one. So go to the uh, Sports Conflict Institute and check out the uh, Knowledge Center. You can find the strains of the game there. So if folks want to engage with you further, Joshua, if there's you know, some reason they got a question for you or they, they need some help from you, how can folks reach you? Yeah, so we're everywhere. Certainly the website's a great starting place, sportsconflict.org. There are ways to contact us and, and get involved. All of our social media is up there. We're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn. We have a blog that we run. We're on Google+. Plus. We do Google+, Plus Hangouts. Um, but one of the great ways always is Twitter. And so I have a personal handle, which is at Joshua Gordon, and then the institute itself is at Sport Conflict. Uh, both of those are great resources to follow the latest challenges and, and trends going on in sports, but also some of the, the constructive things that you can do to make your experience better. We, we tend to focus on the neck up more than the neck down, but uh, obviously both of those matter that they're connected. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So at Joshua Gordon or at Sports Conflict, is that right? You got it. Absolutely. Okay. Twitter's great, but go to sportsconflict.org and you'll, you'll find Org. all those ways right there. You can find it there. Closing thoughts, closing comments. Well, certainly, I, I think one of the, the fun things for us is that more and more coaches, athletes, administrators, supporters are starting to understand that sports are complex. And when you're talking about complex issues, you can't have simple solutions always. Sometimes you need solutions that are elegant and nuanced, and, and that's really where we spend a lot of our time uh, is trying to understand it's not just a matter of sitting down at a table and having a mediation that doesn't work in this environment so often, right? And so what we're really trying to do is embed a number of these skills, teach them in the way you would teach any sports-specific skill. So they require practice, they require repetition, and they require an infrastructure that incentivizes and supports these things. So we're, we look at it as a very holistic endeavor, um, but we're certainly uh, looking for more folks in the world who are doing this work in this space. There's a, it's a big industry, and we'd, we'd love to have more company there. Well, Joshua, thank you again for being on the show. You, you really gave us some, some great insight. Great. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Texas Conflict Coach. We hope you've enjoyed the program. You can find over 300 podcasts archived to listen at your own convenience at texasconflictcoach.com or download the podcast at iTunes or Stitcher Radio. To learn about upcoming radio programs and resources, sign up for our monthly e-newsletter.